most of us, unfortunately, may think of that success as did I get a job today, or at least did I get a, you know an offer into the field of my choice, etc. And so most days you're going to come up with a big goose egg. Welcome back to Career Therapy, where we are exploring the hidden side of modern work. My name is Martin McGovern, your host and founder of Career Therapy, and I'm excited today to introduce Rudd Hopkins, who is a career coach, author, and founder of PM Potential, helping product managers break into the field and move up in their careers. Today we talk about staying sane during the job search and we share stories of our different coaching experiences and the ways that we work with our clients. So I'm extremely excited to bring you today's episode. Stay tuned and without further ado, here's my conversation with Rudd. Let's just start. Tell us a little bit about how you got into uh, into coaching and into product management. Yeah, of course. And again, thank you for making time. I really, really appreciate it. And so for me, in, in case of where I'm at, um, there have been a myriad, a ton of people that have helped me along the way. I, and when I was in the goal or of mine uh, earlier on in my career was to, of course, break into product management. And previous to that, I had a background with education, a graduate degree in education, instructional design. I knew I loved the idea of learning how to learn or the big fancy word some people might call it is this metacognition. So where am I when I learn the best? What conditions exist when I learn the best? All those different things that are built into an ideal learning experience. So that was just some of the interest of mine as again, I moved into the field software development or the tech industry in the role of a product manager, I had many people teach me how to, of course, become proficient in the industry to then be, of course, an official product manager. And so once I had that experience where I was hired, someone took a chance on me as a, an associate product manager and trained me up, my mentors then at that time began referring other people to me to be able to share just some of my experience. Of course, I was not the oracle of knowledge. It was just, I had done it and they wanted to know how they might do it too. So I started to share with them the different things I had learned. And I realized over talking to a number of them that there were these core lessons that I had um, really just ingrained in my learning. And so I began to use my instructional designer learning experience design background to create curriculum, create courses, content, etc to help people understand maybe where they are at currently and then formulate questions that I could then help them with or help answer in any way, or of course, connect them to somebody else that might be able to help them. And so on, again, that's been about five years in the case of making, being into that position. And so along the way of my own product management career path, I've really tried hard to stay connected to others so that I might be able to help them reach their potential. And as we've talked in other cases, my personal mission statement is that as I enable the potential of others or enable others to reach their potential, I'll reach mine. And so that's, that's been the interest and driving force for doing what I do. I love it, man. And, and I know that, you know, being a product manager really brings with it a, a different perspective, right? Like, every coach has their own way of doing things. And, um, yeah. you know, you've got people that come from the mental health world. You've got people that come from, you know, uh, myself, I come from the marketing world. So I have a little bit of a marketing flair to it. And so what do you think is unique about, you know, the field you come from that, that brings a, a different perspective to the coaching world? Yeah. And <clears throat> I, I think that there's, there's a lot to it. And I think, of course, how we approach our craft has a lot to do with our personal history. And for me, which I do not think I'm at all unusual, is my career path has felt pretty circuitous. It feels like a, a kind of squiggly line going to what we would think of as the upper right quadrant, like the desired, whatever that is, but it's had plenty of twists and turns. And so when coming into or when thinking of that field of product management 
and of course, specifically is as my background, my graduate education also enabled me to understand that I had a knack for the technology field, but specifically in ed tech or education technology. And that is really the business of learning or the business of education. And, um, and so anyway, in that field, there is there are a number of things that help drive forward learners or help drive outcomes. And so myself as a learner and as a professional, I began to see these patterns. And so in product management, you can and might use certain frameworks and thinking of, I want this product to be the best it can be or to reach its potential, deliver value to a customer, a desired audience, et cetera, right? there's a very important and impactful paradigm shift when you think of yourself as the product and you understand that I myself have certain features, I have certain skill sets, right? I have strengths, I have so many things for my, to be able to offer, but I need to be able to find the right audience for this offering, that product market fit, if you will. And so there are some frameworks that help an individual that doesn't have to be a product manager. I mean, it could be your, you don't have to be involved in tech to know how to use some of these things, but, and I'm not the first one to use them. I don't coin anything. It's just uh, grateful for people sharing what they know. And so <clears throat> if you think about in one instance, um, one of the frameworks that's pretty popular and is used throughout product management is called an opportunity solution tree. And that is, in simple way, it's making at the very top, like a hierarchical tree. And you think of the very top as the most important item. And that most important could and is very well a desired outcome. This is what I'd like to have happen eventually or in the long run, or this is my vision. And so oftentimes in the product role, you'll think of that as I want to improve retention. I want more people to use this. Right. I want to improve engagement. I want them to use it more often. These are just different things that you could put in that desired outcome. But what if you took out that and you put in what I want with my career as the desired outcome? So if I want stability, I want to develop my talents. I want my values to drive my career. Um, and I want I want to have meaningful relationships. Right. You could think of those as a desired outcome. So then you just reverse engineer, okay, what are the opportunities that would lead me to this? And the point being is there's not only one way to achieve a desired outcome, there's multiple ways. And what then would happen is you reverse engineer down to, okay, I think a role in this industry doing these things would be, get me to that desired outcome. Now, how can I quickly test and iterate? How can I test right now with the least amount of effort for the greatest amount of learning, does this move the needle for my desired outcome or not? And it's not perfect, but that would help and does help structure how we approach in life. We have so many opportunities, so many, but do they all help us again, reach that desired outcome is the question. And how quick can you experiment to know yes or no? And so that's just one of, of a number of frameworks that can help um, an individual, I think, just boil down the answers they already have. I think you feel the same way, Martin. It's like no one hires or talks to you because you know the answer to everything. Right. <laughs> that doesn't exist. But the fact that we can and help enable others to see the answers they already have. They just don't have maybe all the context to find those things out. Yeah, so. or maybe they don't have the right questions, right? A lot of times yeah. we're asking the wrong questions. And so, you know, when getting any product into a market, right, there's any number of things that can go wrong. And so I'm kind of curious, yeah. you know, in your experience developing products um, and in your experience developing people, where, where do things go? get stuck or go wrong or go off the rails? And are they similar between the two different, you know, sort of sure. uh, applications? Yeah. Well, as far as things that maybe uh, there's, there's a phrase that is often used in, let's say the tech industry, but it, they call it failing forward. And I don't think, I think it's probably very easy to pick up on what that means just from the words itself. You can infer what that is. 
And so the, the case being is that you are or must always be driving towards, as we just talked about, a desired outcome. There's a number of ways to get there. And we're not going to you know, be infallible. We're not going to always avoid the wrong choice and always make the right choice. And so, like you said, there are hiccups, there are missteps, there are different things that we experience along the way. So as a product manager and as a person, we could just say the some of the parallels that exist is when we try something and then we understand or think of it as a dead end. It didn't work and I'm not at all, on, I don't understand what I should do next in case of a product or as a step in a career or just in an experience. That um, often indicates that we did not or we weren't very clear on what the problem was we were solving or what was the bigger desired outcome or what was the long term. And so when we do have those things in mind, we're understanding like we just went through, there are multiple approaches. So we will find the ones that don't work. And yet we will know there are other ways to test and other ways to fail forward and that we eliminated. I would also say, as, as I think you have felt in your own experience and the business, strategy is more about what you're not going to do than what you are going to do. And so when you think about these things as you learn about products and people and things that don't work, there needs to be a very strong alignment to the bigger picture or the bigger outcome. And there's also different ways and it's not always applicable between product and people as far as like metrics for success um, and how are you going to have a leading indicator, something that'll tell you ahead of time and then a lagging indicator that'll tell you, you know, in your rearview mirror, these things happen and that's great. Like 2020, like, uh, what is it? The fact being is hindsight is always 2020, right? But the fact, and just again, moving forward is you should and must always be grounded in the bigger picture to allow for a failure to not be a barrier, but yet a redirect and understanding the rest. So that's just a little bit of how I understand it, but I know I'm not, you know, that's not the perfect answer for all of our questions. I really agree with what you're saying there because, um, you know, this idea of strategy being about saying no to things and really one of the, I think the benefits of being a coach or one of the benefits of working with a coach is that they help you eliminate options. Like you said, they help you get rid of the noise and the scatter. And it's actually one of the reasons why every once in a while I'll be like, dang, I should probably get a business coach because I tend to be very scattered and like every week I come up with like 10 new ideas of what to do. And, and it really is, it's, it's this process of elimination. And so um, I'm just kind of curious, I'd love to dig in a little deeper on that idea. Um, because we're talking about staying sane during the job search, what are some of the, maybe the things that make people scatter? Like what, where is the attention going and what do we have to bring our attention back to? Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. And I think to case of like we're talking and grounding ourselves, you might say is another way to, to express that thought. Um, in case of job search, there's a number of things that I think have uh, proven distracting or proven in many ways, not very fruitful to me. And I know many other individuals as well, is that when, when we go about understanding or thinking that our success metrics have most to do with something that someone else controls or something in fact being in this job search, how do you think of yourself as successful? How is it each day that at the end of the day, I can say to myself, today was a good day. Like I, I put in the work and I did what I needed. Most of us, unfortunately, may think of that success as, did I get a job today? And that's, or at least did I get, a, you know, an offer into the field of my choice, et cetera. And so most days you're going to come up with a big goose egg and you're going to think, holy cow, that was so bad. Let me think about how could I change it tomorrow and get a different result. Now, it's not to say that's bad. That's fantastic to get, continue to be creative in how you're approaching that desired outcome. But ultimately, what we're doing is hinging our bets on the control of other people. 
And so when, again, thinking about staying focused, one effort is the fact that you must and we must continue to focus on, they're called, and we can think of them as actionable metrics. So in the product world, you can think of like, there's a lean startup. It's not necessarily just product, but the book Lean Startup and many others, they call these two things vanity metrics and actionable metrics, right? And vanity, like vanity, the word, of course, would infer it's just for appearance. That's all it is. It just gives you a number and it goes up and you're like, wonderful, this is great. Let's celebrate. I'm, you know, we're successful. And then it goes down and everyone says, why? And you say, I don't even know how it went up. So I'm not sure. But an actionable metric would, of course, allow you to say, I did exercise A that led to this influence of this metric. And then it went down. So I know what actions I can take to increase that metric once again, or whatever the influence you want to do, if you want to decrease some metric, et cetera. So just continuing to think of it as actionable metrics. And those actionable metrics as defined are something you can control with your actions. So in your day, if it's a job search, you could say, or the next step, you know, growing in your career, your skills, et cetera. Some things you might consider as actionable metrics are things like how many conversations did I have this day or that day with certain people? How many resources did I find? Meaning how many new companies, how many places that are offering, uh, I guess, growth in the industry, even newsletters, networking events, things like that. So resources, and then how many contacts have I made in say a given day towards that goal? So not the only way to measure, but again, it's so critical that we think of actionable metrics that are tied to that desired outcome so that each day, yes, we might think of so many cool new ideas and that's important, but I would think it's then important to then say, how do these apply to my metrics and my desired outcome? And then think of that as you go forward, but always and always, there's just another approach that I, we can get into as well, but it's testing out hypotheses too. And that, that also is very fruitful. And when I get all these ideas, what do I do with them? So. And the big thing that we're really circling here is the difference between a reactive job search and a proactive job search, right? If you make a hypothesis yep. and then go test it, if you set up a bunch of things that you want to do and you execute on that, it's very different than waiting for LinkedIn to email you a bunch of things that you may maybe want, but you don't know. Yeah. And then you go apply mm -hmm. to these highly competitive jobs. I think a really good example of what you're talking about here is every Friday with one of my uh, cohorts of students, we, we have a working session. It's literally just an hour on Friday where I, we log on, I hit, I hit play on Spotify and put on some lo-fi beats of like different you know, movies and stuff like yeah. that. And, sure. uh, and at the beginning of the call, I always say, look, for the next hour, I want you to pick one thing, one thing only that you will get done by the end of this hour. And we're going to knock it out before the weekend. And inevitably, someone will say, I want to uh, update my portfolio. And I go, that could take an hour, that could take a month. That is not a clear goal. Because what ends right. up happening is that we're like, we, we have in our head, like, oh, I need to do the big thing. I need to do something big in order to make progress when in reality if we can't even do the small thing or if we can't even write down a small goal let alone accomplish a small goal how are we ever going to expect to do the big one and so i think that what you're saying is really important because what ends up happening after a few weeks is people are like my goal for the end of the hour is to send this one email to someone and then they do it and they're like wow i actually did what i said i was going to do today oh my gosh yeah. i actually I can trust myself to follow through on the things I say versus like, you know, the typical joke is, you know, someone who keeps saying, I'm going to go to the gym tomorrow and they never go. What they're doing is practicing lying to themselves rather than practicing an honest execution of smaller things that add up over time. And then, you know, we can actually take on bigger and bigger tasks. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was, I was going to just mention is that um, another just very helpful framework or frameworks or effort in general, many in the industry in just tech software, the roles of product manager or a product manager is absolutely dependent on in order to prioritize. 
understanding what are we doing and why are we doing that and why are we doing that before this and after that and so many other things that are in some ways you can only have 80% confidence you never get to 100% but you just need to go with it but i would just mention is the fact that like you're saying there is and often is the challenge of prioritizing my time and what will make the biggest difference and so like you're saying to break it down to the smallest piece and then build up from there helps us to prioritize correctly with the time frame we're given so that we can make a difference um, big or small but always a difference no matter the time we spend absolutely and i think you know as coaches a lot of times you know we guide people through these exercises we get them to these places where they're focusing on smaller goals and the goal, like the purpose of it is to reduce the stress, is to make it easier, to make it feel more, uh, make you feel more accomplished every day. But every time we try to address a stress, we tend to, you know, poke another stressor, right? So I'm kind of curious, you know, what are some of the resistance? What are the resistance? Uh, how do I even phrase this? What kind of resistance do you see in people as they try to make these changes, right? Because there's going to be a reaction to any positive movement that we try to make forward. If I understand correctly, again, you're thinking about what might be the hiccups, the speed bumps, the... Or where in their mentality do they resist, right? Like if you, mm -hmm. say, if you say, go do an informational interview, people logically can understand it, but emotionally they have resistance to it. So I'm curious where you see that emotional resistance maybe show up yeah. and, and how, how do you address it? Well, as far as just understanding the value that something will bring in the case of an action and what it is that we may often associate that action with or like you said, the barrier to doing something, especially if it's new. Um, <laughs> I was going to say is that, and often like the lifeblood of your career search has a lot is networking, right? And understanding how can I connect to the people that would have a most meaningful influence on or who I can learn from most, et cetera. And when we talk about that, or when I cover that um, with those people that I help, uh, there is a big in many ways, kind of like a red flag when you talk about that activity, in many ways, because it's seen as a disgenuine reach out to someone, ask for something from a person you don't know, and cross your fingers, something positive comes of it, and then keep doing it over and over again. And then you just, again, that if you've described, you didn't use the word networking, but you said, hey, I want you to do these things. I think anyone would say no, like, there's no way I want to do that. That's just so uncomfortable and so i would say a quote comes to my mind and that is uh, it's actually my namesake rudyard kipling and the quote that he um, shared was that of all the liars in the world some of the greatest are our own fears and fear doesn't need to look like going against you know a wrestling match against a giant or like facing this predator of some kind or anything that might spark fear initially but fear definitely comes from being unfamiliar or being uncomfortable and so when coming up against these barriers oftentimes it will take and is a, a methodical approach and it's also kind of being able to recognize the steps so that I can have a system in place that guides me where emotion won't take me. And so if, for instance, they are, if I they challenge them to do, let's say networking, right? And then if I say, hey, make 10 contacts, whatever it is, there will be a question innately about, hey, what should the email say? Or what should the message say when I reach out to someone on LinkedIn? What should I ask for when I get to that point? And what should I do as a follow-up if there is something that should come of it and I don't know how to tactfully come back around to it, et cetera. And so again, defaulting to these kind of scripts, to these like steps in how they do it, there is just to say, I don't need to walk through all of them, but we give them like a sample, like this is what it should say. This is what some questions you should ask or could ask during it. This is some possible outcomes that you could 
just choose what you'd like. And um, these are the ways you repeat that in a non-forcible way or a non, a, a not a disgenuine way. So I guess the long story short is many fears can be overcome by a sense of a script or a structure or steps, right? And then just one small one at a time go through. I love the way you phrased that. You said it's a system that takes us where our emotions won't. And I think so yeah. often we're trying to follow what feels good rather than what is good, right? Like it feels good to stay on the couch and eat a bag of Cheetos, right? Um, yeah. But that's not that's not what is good as much as I uh, I, I tend to do the the Cheeto TV watching. But yeah, uh, <laughs> cheese uh, puffs are my favorite. Oh, honestly. the puffs are the best, and even the natural well, ones have a real good crunch to them. <laughs> well, and and the other thing I think too, Martin, in this just space isn't always just is my balance between what I don't want. Let's see what comes naturally. What do I prefer to do? Or how do I spend my time most in the most valuable way? Because there is often times where, you know, someone will balance a hobby that they have their work. And then there's the other things they do in their time. Right. If, and so it's the fact of like choosing between two good things, or it may be like, I have to cut this great thing out to be able to make time for the other things too. And so again, red flags or blockers may often be something like, hey, I'm working on something else that really excites me. And I just don't maybe want to give that up. I want to keep that. And so in those situations, um, then I would therein invite them, how might you just merge the two? How could you network using your hobby? If it's someone else that say an enthusiast for X, Y, or Z, I don't know. Uh, model airplanes, <laughs> we'll go figure. But something that may not be career driven, but it's also a strong interest or hobby. Could you find in like model airplane clubs, people who work in this same industry or in this some role? Or could you go approach someone who works for a model plane manufacturing company in a role that you're interested in? And then you can use that to talk shop and connect and then obviously continue your search. So it's, I don't know if it's always, I think like Covey, Stephen Covey covers this and many other things, but it's the win-win thinking, how do I take what I'm doing and help that propel me to maybe do something I'm not, you know, I wouldn't choose to do first. That's exactly right. Yeah. It reminds me of actually two examples. I had one person that I was coaching and he ended up meeting a bunch of developers through his clash of clans Slack group, which that's yeah. not on any how to get a job <laughs> list that nope. I've seen out there. Uh -huh. And another person really wanted to get into sports technology. And uh, they're like, well, there's no meetups. And I go create one. So he ended up creating a meetup um, for sports tech, like uh, esports tech. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. And he ended up getting the, he reached out to the director of EA Sports, um, text, the director of technology. That person couldn't come, but that person sent their like direct report. And that person yeah. came, spoke at the event, 25 people came. And now this person was not just attending an event about esports, but was running the event on esports. Yeah. And so they got to meet the the person that worked at EA Sports, or I think it was EA Sports. And then they got to yeah. um the person was like, Hey, so what's your deal? Are you like looking for internships? What what's going on with you? And now they're they're not just someone in the room, they are the contact yeah. for that topic. And so I 100% yep. agree with you on that. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. so as we think about all this stuff, you know, we we go into our routines, we go into our success metrics, we, we try to move away from these vanity metrics to the actionable metrics, which is a very difficult thing as soon as you put someone into LinkedIn, right? And you say, all right, time to start using LinkedIn for your job search. People go, great. Yep. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe you, I'm going to get on that platform. And then a month later, they're like that. It, I mean, it still is a social network. It still is absorbing your time, hooking you, hitting the dopamine receptors. And sometimes yes. I have to like really tell people like use it as a scalpel, not as a blunt instrument, like use it as a research tool, not as a social media tool. Um, what are some of the ways that the good things, like some of these actionable metrics, like what are the ways that people can, um, maybe overdo it or maybe do it, but not do it in the way that's truly effective, right? Um, are, are there any 
things that you've come across where you're like, you're kind of doing the right thing, but for some reason it's not really hitting? Like what, what, what sort of things have you seen out there? Yeah. Um, I would say I'll first be the one to admit that I have fallen prey to the case of using LinkedIn more as a social media tool than as a, a job or a, a career building tool. A career propellant. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the fact being is, and unfortunately, uh, we as human beings can all fall into the trap of, let's say, comparisons, right? That become the downfall of most in the case of I leave some experience feeling dejected or discouraged and many other things. So in fact of, you know, the approach of using LinkedIn and it's to like its capacity, if you want, or to its potential, I think actually one thing that's really um, been important and I've strive to do is that like those social media platforms, you can get, let's say lost. And so I have, or I've had the goal of whenever I go to those sites, I need to have already written down a list of things I want to accomplish while I'm there. So as to be able to, if I find myself, you know, maybe feeling disorganized, et cetera, I can quickly reference okay, I came here to accomplish these things. Um, moving forward with just how you might powerfully use like the LinkedIn tool for networking, et cetera. Um, there is of course the, the advantage of connecting with people that you already know. And sometimes you may have known them and it's been a long time and you're not exactly where, sure, like where they've ended up in this past eight years, you've, you've known them and what exactly they're doing. And so I would just say is that sometimes we look to a network to connect us to people we don't know and build new contacts. But oftentimes and most times that connection is gonna come through someone in common. Those are the most important and most powerful ways to be able to grow your network. And so I would not overlook the value of continuing to check in with people you already know or have known for a while. And, and know where they're at. And then of course the things they're learning and something like an informational interview where you just ask someone for time and you set out the goal as far as, I just wanna learn what you've learned in your career as you've gone along and the skills you've gained and et cetera. Um, so again, understanding what you already have a connection to. And then when you do connect and you do have rapport with them, there can and would be an opportunity for you to ask, hey, I'm as I've sh shared a little bit, my goal is to find out more or to meet X or whatever that is. Might I look through your network? And if there is someone of value or interest in my goal, could I reach out to you and share with you why I would like to talk to them? And then if you're comfortable with it, then you could obviously link me or connect me or introduce me to that person thereafter. And Doing that will, of course, continue to multiply the outcome because every connection you make, as far as I've continued to do, you kind of gauge like how willing are they to help? I just got to kind of get a feel for their emotion, where they're at. And, and if they are willing, then I will ask that same question and allow me access to their network to ask them. And then it, of course, it goes on and on and on. And so I would just say is we're not all in sales. That's not something we've all been trained in, but leads are everything. If we could all adopt something from some other profession, if you're not already in sales, I think we have to, in a job search, think leads or die. We have to have leads. We have to have people to talk to. And so how we can, one, is properly, tactfully um, ask for those abilities, but then also give back where you possibly can, however you can. If you can't directly contribute to someone, then you can ask, hey, tell me a little bit about what, what kind of goals that you have or what things are you working towards? And the, the great thing that happens is that you begin to connect people and allowing for, hey, I have this goal or I'm looking to do this. Like, hey, I know someone who does that. Would you be willing or want to connect with those people? And again, I think Malcolm Gladwell did that well when he was talking about the ability to be a connector. And that's, I think, what we might think, not always think of, but 
again, as my mission, and I firmly believe as you're enabling the potential of others, you'll reach yours, no matter who you are and what you're doing. And that's really, in my mind, you know, where it, it makes so much sense when you just sort of lay it out that way. But then you see people get in trouble, right? Because the way you phrase that, you're like, we're not all salespeople, but we got to borrow a little bit from the salespeople, right? And yeah. I think a big thing that I see in the resistance that people have to things is this idea that like, I'm a developer and I just want to do my development work and I don't want to learn these other skills. And it's not, you know, I don't want to be on social media. I don't want to network. I don't want to do these things because the reason I chose my field is because I'm good at, I'm an introvert who's good at date at like detail oriented work. Right. And yeah. then you come, we come to them as coaches and we're like, sorry, but you actually do have to learn how to network and you actually do have to learn how to maybe not, you know, totally enmesh yourself with social media, but use it as a research tool and use it as a way to connect and, and all these different things. And I think, you know, it's, it's easier if you come from the world of marketing to like, be like, okay, I get it. I have to brand myself, but it's hard when you come from these other technical fields to be like, wait, why do I have to do all that stuff? And, and, you know, the reverse is true as well, right? If you're a artist and you want to build a career around art, you're probably going to have to learn a little bit of finance and you'll have to learn a little bit of these like uh, like web development, maybe just enough yeah. to use Squarespace or something. And so it really is like we can't be in these silos. And I think one of the hardest parts of the job search for people is realizing that it's a skill in and of itself, right? And so, you know, if you want to bring a product to market, if you want to do anything like that, you need to have five or six different kinds of skills to draw upon, right? And so the same with the job search. If you want to bring yourself to market, to go back to what we were talking about at the beginning, you need to realize that there's a handful of skills that are necessary to make this happen. And I'm just sort of curious, you know, what are the little things that, that you think or that you've sort of helped people borrow from these different professions in order to build a well-rounded approach to their search? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, obviously you can't te teach what you don't know <laughs> in many ways. And so as far as just, you know, and, and maybe the fact of, of branching out of understanding um, and how to again powerfully move to where you would like to be, like you just mentioned sales and I mentioned sales, right? And then of course, like you said, mentioning or sorry, marketing or branding and what it is you have, you know, your personal mission is X. And I want to know that and convey that because people always want to know, tell me about you. Like that's obviously a question everyone asks and you're not going to start from your childhood and go on until now. So you need to understand a, just a concise way to tell me about you. And this is like Simon Sinek, this is start with why, why I do what I do. Um, outside of that, I mean, there's obviously the fact of, and there's maybe different silos, but I mean, if you think about <laughs> things like customer success, right, there's operations, there's HR, um, there's a number of other things that you would see maybe in a company, if we're going to extend that analogy. Um, if when thinking about just again, general skills that are needed. I think that you would and should often branch into things like your um, business analyst roles and understanding if you can and how you can quantify and then project what it is you're doing and how it's gonna get you to where you wanna go. And I know, like you said, an example of developers, there are many professions who are and tend to be an introvert and also don't necessarily, I think this is just human beings in general. We're not anxious to get outside of our skill set. We just want to get really, really good at what we're doing in the moment. And so I would say is if your drive is to propel yourself, and that's not uncommon, but if your first goal is to drive yourself, you are going to continue to focus on the things that you see as important. But if your goal is to develop as you go along the way, others, however you might or whenever you might, you're going to go to the lengths of, again, learning new things to benefit 
other people more than yourself. So I don't know if it's a one skill or one other career path or one other industry that would lean on heavily with all of those. There could be a mix of most of them. But I think, again, that mental block is what's it going to get me? What's in it for me? And if we can and might think about it, what's in it for someone else, then I think that in many ways it enables us to overcome that barrier. Yeah, that shift from a me focus to a them focus is huge. And it also will differentiate people in their search, right? Because then you'll go into interviews and you'll be the person who's got the helpful mindset, who's got the, you know, maybe this role is not right for me, but I know someone else who can definitely help your company instead of getting bitter and being like, it wasn't right for me and now I'm upset, you know, like bringing yeah. that in is huge. Well, well, even when they, when we go into an interview and saying to the fact of, hey, there's these like scripted questions that most people ask in an interview and that's great, but tell me about, and again, reversing in some ways, not uh, in a conniving way, but reversing the interview. Tell me about your needs. Tell me about what you're up against. Tell me about the challenges that keep you up and let's maybe even just in a really quick way, let's brainstorm something that might be an addition to what you've thought of or could be helpful for you to take back to your team, et cetera. And again, if, if you can continue to do that wherever you go, then you will be sought after because that's why you, you know, you tick is to see those needles move for others and that moves yours. Yeah. And, and in comparison to what a lot of people out there interviewing are doing, which is saying, am I going to have a mentor in this role? Am I going to, what's the vacation days in this role? What, what is there, you know, the environment of the office, what's the culture? It's like, all these questions are very selfish and while important to a degree, number one, you don't get good answers when you ask these questions. And number two, right. you don't even always get truthful answers when you ask these questions, no. right? Like, how's the mm -hmm. culture? We love working here. I work here and I'm working here right now. I don't want to you know, bash my company yeah. in an interview. Absolutely. And so, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And I think a big piece of all of this, and I think one of the things that you, you mentioned earlier that I think helps people stay sane more than anything else is accepting the reality of things, right? Yes. I think one mm -hmm. of the things that messes us up the most in the job search, and you know, this is not just the job search, right? Like if you're going to start a business and you're like, well, I'm just not going to use social media. Okay. Have a good time marketing your business, right? Like you've got to mm -hmm. do something or, you know, it's like, oh, I want to write a book, but I don't actually want to sit down and, and, and block off time every day to do it. Right. Like, then you're yeah. never going to write that book. And, and I think that there's this, um, there's this resistance to the job search because it is so cumbersome, because the companies take six to seven interviews to make their decision and, and give you a bunch of homework assignments. And the online application process can, you know, it says upload something and then you have to type it in anyway. Like there's all these flaws in the job search yeah. process, right? Sure. That drive people crazy, especially when you're, losing money, maybe digging into your savings. Time is, there's a gap forming on your resume, but it's almost like we're adding insult to injury sometime, right? Like the process yeah. is already flawed and we're resisting the things that work. And I think that that's mm -hmm. such an interesting place to be because it yep. really increases the pain meter in people's, mm -hmm. in people's lives. I'm curious what you've seen in that, in that, you know, sort of perspective and what are some of the things that you know, maybe you do to help people accept the realities of things and work within the system rather than trying to like break out of it or, or maybe you do help them get around the system. What are, what are some of the ideas that, that you've been sharing with folks? Yeah. So I would say like you're sharing, um, being, let's say, of course you're in one role and you're looking for a better one and maybe that role is toxic or whatever else. It's not getting to where you are where you want to be, it's a dead end and it feels defeating, if you want to call it that. And then of course, another situation is you don't altogether have a role or a job, so you're unemployed. And you're thinking, of course, around the constraints. You're thinking about what's not going right or what's hard every day or what stresses you. And the very human things that come to our minds most immediately, even in the mornings, I think you could have a good judge of the quality of your life, if you when you wake up in the morning, what comes to your mind? What's the thing you think about the first 30 minutes of your day? And it's not that there is a perfect thing to be thinking of, but 
if again, your mind immediately goes to those discouragement, those stresses, um, those resistance of things, then that can tell you, of course, that there is a lot of that throughout your day. And it should and might also look at you thinking about, first of all, how am I cognizant? How am I thinking? How am I, what thoughts am I entertaining? As a human being, we have up around 60,000 thoughts a day. And that is staggering to think about how many different things you think about. And when you have these thoughts, again, we have them and then we react to them. And our emotions are in many ways dictated by that. So I would just, I would share is the fact that there are so many important practices that can precede the time we sit down to then do a job search or whenever we set aside time, there's lots that come before it that can help make that the best time possible. I talked a little bit about that metacognition of learning how to learn. You put yourself in the right environment and you understand what helps you and then you powerfully move forward. I just was going to quickly share is when we practice the ability to control our thoughts and that in other words can look like meditation or might look like a practice of that which is again simply slowing down enough to understand what i'm thinking and decide if i want to or don't want to think that way i is this thought useful or helpful and if it is then keep it if it's not useful or helpful then you know move on control that and so um, as I move through the day and thinking about those blocks, I've, I've found that, um, like anybody else, I get to a certain point in my day and I feel a way that I don't want to feel. And at that point, I'll write down how I feel, whether, you know, discouraged, uh, angry, frustrated, you know, there's a myriad of things I could feel. And then I, I make a list of, okay, so how do I want to feel? What are the things I want to recognize? So yeah, I want to be encouraged. I want to be enabled. I want to feel happiness, like these different emotions, right? And then after that, I think, okay, so how, what are the first steps for me to get from where I am to where I want to be? And then I start thinking of, again, immediate actions I can take that will help switch that emotion from one to the other. And so as you were talking a little bit about that acceptance of what is now or what is the process what are the ways that you like you're saying things that weigh you down about the search or the progress and if you have to get around them etc and i would suggest or even propose that it's not the process in many times that's broken it's our tra train of thought and how we approach it and that's not to say there are perfect systems out there or perfect people but if we feel like something is broken or something's not working well, if we were in the right mental state, we would think about how to improve it. If we were in a discouraged mental state, we would think about how wrong it is and how useless it is and many other negative things. And so when you accept something, it's not saying like, I like this or I condone this or this is awesome, I'd vote for it, whatever it is. But it's a matter of fact of, this is out of my control and I can, in my mind or ever, whatever other way, out, out loud if I want to acknowledge it is this way, this is what has happened and I'm moving on in controlling what's going to happen. It's like living in this world of it was supposed to have been easy. It was supposed to have happened this way. I wasn't supposed to have had this happen and so on, that supposed to have world. And as we live in there, that entertains in many ways, the negative things that come along with it. But when it's, no, it did happen. This is what happened. And this is what I'm going to make of it as I go on. Then that speed to accept allows us to uh, relinquish what we can't control and move on with what we can control. And I'll just really quickly give an example. Uh, so I have a young family and Saturdays are these days where I have these awesome things planned where we're gonna get all these things done like, you know, the things we don't often do all the time for fun, like cleaning and so on. And I'll start out the day with these ambitions. And then by, let's say, lunchtime, two of the five things or one of the six things has happened that I planned and thinking, 
God, that was a waste. Like, this is the worst. And when I get to that point, I have to think to myself, or I could think to myself, okay, what happened has happened. It's not bad. And I didn't accomplish these certain things. So now that I'm in my, you know, half of the day, it's noon. What are the things I could reasonably control or accomplish in the second half that would help me just feel like the day is well spent or it was a good day? And so I can adjust and accept and move towards what else I can do with the rest of my time or the next day or whatever it is. And so I don't need to feel like my kids didn't cooperate and this was a waste of a Saturday, but I can say, these are what happened. And I appreciated that we could get these things done. And then I'm going to try the next, the next Saturday or Sunday or whatever it is. But again, speed to acceptance. I love it. And I think we can end right there. Um, so where can folks find you uh, and follow along with what you're doing? Yeah. So um, again, LinkedIn, like we've just talked up and down, <laughs> that's one place for sure. And then uh, for a case of coaching and understanding more, there's pmpotential.com that you can go look at or Rudyard at PM Potential. And then again, as mentioned, I've, I've also written a, a playbook for those that um, are in the middle of a job search, um, just starting one, whatever stage you're at, it's a playbook of action items you can take. So I'd love to um, give you a free copy, whoever would like one. My goal is to give away a thousand or more. Very cool. Yeah. So definitely check them out. Uh, if you have any trouble finding them, just check the links in the description or on the screen here. And Rudd, thanks for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Awesome. Thank you, Martin. The pleasure's all mine. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this episode today. I really appreciate your support of what we're building here at Career Therapy as we continue to try and explore the hidden side of modern work and tell some of the stories that maybe don't get enough light shed on them. If you enjoyed what you listened to today, I hope you will leave us a review on iTunes. Uh, subscribe to this wherever you're listening or watching on YouTube, Spotify, etc. And uh, share this with some friends who you know are going through similar experiences and looking to build their career and, and gain some insights along the way. Again, thank you so much for stopping by, and I wish you the best. I'll see you on the next episode.